Thank you so much. It really is an honor and privilege to be here. Last March, Johns Hopkins University hosted a symposium on the future of the humanities in which leaders in humanities scholarship and education gathered to discuss the potential of the humanities to enrich and inform our lives through the formulation of moral challenges and historical lessons. In his opening address, the president of George Washington University, Stephen Knapp, argued that there is an enduring and irresolvable dilemma that defenders of the humanities must countenance. The dilemma, according to Knapp, results from the fact that as humanities scholars build generalizations in an attempt to illustrate the utility of the humanities, such as the ability to, quote, illuminate the interaction of different cultures, to foster certain values, to criticize traditional assumptions, and so on, end quote, the further away they get from the original source of our interest in the objects and events they study. What this means, in his view, is that the academic prestige of work in the humanities, quote, is inherently in tension with the social and cultural prestige such work derives from our interest in the humanities. Knapp concludes that those of us who care about the humanities should resign themselves to this inherent difficulty and, quote, continue pursuing on the one hand the pleasure they take in art and history, and on the other hand, the curiosity that leads them to analyze and explain without either demanding or expecting a stable reconciliation of the two. Rather than resignation to this paradox, a paradox that poses a veritable continental divide between scholarship and the public, I want to assert that the future of the humanities lies in the cultivation of humanities practice, both in traditional and innovative ways. Such practice is indebted to and sometimes embedded in but not reducible to the scholarly tradition. Moreover, unless we recognize the practice of humanities as essential to bridging the gap between the scholarly humanistic traditions and the everyday interest in objects and events that are the basis of aesthetic and other humanistic experiences, then we truly are in danger of falling into the irresolvable dilemma that Knapp outlines. Humanistic practice is the key to the survival of the humanities because these practices are the translation mechanisms through which the relevance of the tradition becomes obvious. So what is the concept of humanities practice that I've posited as a necessity? Stepping back, let us first consider the vast landscape of the humanities, both inside and outside of the academy. For the sake of analysis and clarity, we can subdivide the terrain into four separate, if interrelated, regions. I call these regions humanities practice, humanities questions, humanities endeavors, and humanities scholarship. Firstly, humanistic questions. Humanities questions are everywhere, permeating and punctuating the contours of a life. They are asked on a daily basis by people who might not even think of what they are doing as human humanistic and are often isolated as existential, ethical, or personal reflections. The questions themselves are about the meaning of our world and our existence in the world. These are the matters that keep us up at night and are at the center of countless coming-of-age stories. Is there any point to my existence? How did we get here? Would my white life be worth living if I ended up like my parents? Well, <laughs> my kids ask this all the time. Um, <laughs> what, if anything, makes a Jackson Pollock better than the splatter I make when I accidentally drop my paintbrush. Such questions lead to the second region in the humanities landscape, humanistic endeavors. Questions contribute to and emerge to endeavors when the issues that preoccupy us get taken up in shared contexts and engagements. Some examples of humanistic endeavors include talking to friends about Cartesian and Lockean questions of personal identity and persistence through time after watching the film The Source Code calling an AM radio station to comment on whether an exhibit of Kara Walker's work should be banned as offensive on the grounds that it reinforces rather than subverts racial stereotypes, writing a love poem or, intending, or attending a coffee house poetry slam, discussing the aesthetics of a painting or the injustice of a baseball commissioner's refusal to award a perfect game after an umpire's missed call, attending a hip-hop performance 
or engaging in an online forum in which participants are trying to identify the next victim and killer from Harper's Island. Humanity's endeavors resonate collectively, even as they explore and express the humanity's questions we tend to ask alone. Yet in each instance, in both questions and endeavors, there need not be any recognition that the reflection or discussion relates to the humanities. The individuals involved are not functioning as capital H humanists. Indeed, unless the participants are academicians or cultural professionals, they are unlikely to be conscious of the humanistic tradition when engaging in humanities questions and endeavors. Nevertheless, these questions and endeavors are distinct regions of the humanistic landscape. A third region, and one most often identified as humanistic in gatherings such as this, covers humanities scholarship. Humanities scholarship is technically interpretive of both humanistic questions and the objects of humanistic endeavors. While it was once in the, once in the tradition of humanities scholarship to address humanistic questions in the public eye, this is increasingly no longer the case. With occasional exceptions among high-profile crossover scholars writing in outlets such as the New York Times or appearing on Charlie Rose, today's humanities scholars pursue their passions well away from the public eye, locked into an institutional treadmill of arcane specialization that does not translate well for more general audiences. One might suggest that humanities scholarship has adopted the mantle of scientism, where the quantification of public published articles in narrowly focused journals constitutes the standard of productivity. Of course the humanities landscape needs and feeds upon specialization, and I would certainly not recommend abandoning technical and intricate research as a foundation for addressing questions and fueling endeavors, if only as an unconscious backdrop in many cases. But humanities questions and endeavors will persist with or without connection to the tradition of human humanistic scholarship. Our question today is this, how do we bridge the widening fissure, Knapp's continental divide, between the generalization of existential questions and populist endeavors on the one bank and the private language of specialized scholarship on the other? My response to the divide identified by Knapp is this, it is not the scholarship, but rather humanistic practices that provides the necessary framework for shaping public awareness of humanistic questions and engagement with humanities endeavors. For those of us who are academicians, teaching undoubtedly constitutes the most enduring form. Communicating with undergraduates in the classroom, mentoring graduate student development, delivering the occasional talk on our subject at venues such as public libraries, nursing homes, continuing education forums, and local businesses. But humanities practice can and does encompass much more than this traditional extension of scholarship, and it attracts practitioners beyond the academy. Some examples, documentary filmmakers and television producers whose subject matter explores and expands our understanding of history, resident ethicists in medical, business, and government settings, those engaging in pro program development for humanities councils and in schools, movie critics, book reviewers, food writers, and others whose work makes a connection between humanistic questions and endeavors and the products of cultural expression, counselors working at the intersection of philosophy and therapy, developers of cultural content for visitor center exhibitions at national parks, wildlife refuges, living museums and civic buildings, radio hosts who call in sh whose call-in shows examine humanistic issues of the day. I know Many of you can generate additional examples, but my point is this. The bridge of humanities practice must reconnect the tradition of scholarship with the persistence of everyday humanistic concerns and activities constituting, and activities constituting such a bridge must be taken seriously within the academy if we are to have any legitimacy beyond it. If we fail to connect the tradition of humanities scholarship with the enduring questions of humanity, we may exacerbate the fissure, fissure between the humanities and the public to the point of creating an unbridgeable canyon. The threat of fissure follows from the fact that much of contemporary scholarship has lost touch with the way issues at the center of human, humanistic inquiry get filtered through ordinary life. Unless we can, in an innovative way, 
successfully close the gap between the public's interest in humanistic questions and humanities scholarship, none of our self-congratulatory rhetoric about the value of the humanities will matter. Humanities programs across the country will continue to be cut as the humani humanistic scholar tradition is reduced to itself precisely because it has not engaged through practice with the questions and endeavors that resonate with those outside of the ivory tower. We must remember that the stereotype for many, the very notion of the ivory tower as a willful disconnect with the practical matters of everyday life is synonymous with the humanities. Such identifications fuel the image of the humanities as a luxury and underlie calls for elimination of humanities programs in favor of vocational and pre-professional programs that are regarded as singularly responding to the demands for economic opportunity. These perceptions are also at the basis of contemporary threats to public libraries. In addition to being the depo depositories of the humanistic tradition, libraries provide uniquely open access to millions of Americans. In underserved communities, they are often the central, if not the sole, point of contact with the humanities. Think back to Richard Wright's autobiographical novel, Black Boy, how he relied on stealthy access to library books afforded him by his kindly boss, relied upon the voice of H.L. Mencken in discovering his own inner voice and potential. How will isolated youth, the dispossessed, and those seeking perspectives on life's enduring questions find common ground across time and place? ground beyond the contingencies of today's politics and fads if they lack access to the stacks of a library or the internet services which they provide. Therefore, the attack on public libraries, demonstrated through diminishing resources, represents even more limited access to the humanities for those who are already the most vulnerable with respect to economic and social capital. It is no wonder that the humanities are considered a luxury and irrelevant to success in a world that equates long-term happiness with wealth. And while those of us in the humanities may condemn the skeptics for being misguided in their supposition that there might be better preparation for future careers in a rapidly changing, globally interdependent world, it is time to recognize the extent to which we have perpetuated this misconception. A major factor in this misconception concerns the status of humanities practice in bridging the gulf between ordinary questions and endeavors on the one hand and scholarly research on the other. The bridge is collapsing, hastened by the fact that too often public intellectuals who play the role of translators are reverting to the language of scholarship. If public intellectuals are only on the side of scholars, we are bound to fail in our efforts to defend the humanities as more than a luxury. I know from my own experience as a bioethicist that a humanist who never steps foot in a hospital and who writes exclusively from a theoretical perspective will not be able to provide frameworks for ethical decision making in the same way as one who is in the trenches. Consider a case in which a healthcare team believes that treatment for a patient is futile, while the family is demanding that everything be done to keep their loved one alive. Being able to analyze and evaluate concepts of medical futility patient autonomy, paternalism, and moral distress will be inconsequential without one being able to offer insights using language and context that is both familiar and speaks directly to the concerns of each individual stakeholder. Or another situation, a young assistant professor wishes to consult and contribute to a documentary film on, say, the history of an artificial reservoir in a local area. There is rich information to be gleaned on displaced communities in the area as well as parallel decisions about public good within the American history. The filmmakers cannot afford to hire history consultants as such, but can offer a small stipend in exchange for high profile production credit and the fulfillment of creating work that will be seen by many people. Unfortunately, the home department of the young professor does not see this type of contribution as counting toward tenure, since it, since it does not fit easily into the mold of traditional scholarship and the humanities have been slow to embrace the concept of civic and professional outreach that is commonplace in land-grant and field science contexts. What we're talking about here is a shift in the way we conceive humanistic practice both within and beyond the academy. The work required to bridge the gap between questions and endeavors on the one hand and scholarship on the other may appear daunting. 
However, the implications of giving in to Knapp's paradox, thereby abandoning the task of providing frameworks through humanities practice and leaving the fissure to widen, are far-reaching and dire. Inasmuch as humanistic scholarly traditions serve as benchmarks and frameworks for ga grappling with abiding humanistic questions and concerns, reserving the humanities for those who can afford elite education or who live in well-heeled communities has profound consequences in terms of egalitarian principles of justice and fairness. The development of a humanistic sense enables individuals to discern the patterns that dominate their lives. And this opportunity should not be the exclusive purview of those like Casaban. He may have been the most learned person in Europe during the 16th century, but his superior knowledge used in exclusive service to the king did not help him as he was being pelted in the streets by those who were denied access to his intellectual gifts. Nor did his namesake in Eliot's Middlemarch reap the benefits of such scholarly erudition sinking into paranoid, bitter loneliness and his inability to apply the very lessons of his theological training. The risk of slipping into Kasabinism is why I included the phrase, the ketchup's in the bag and the check is in the mail, in the title of my talk. It's from a popular country song by Tim McGraw entitled, Would You Like Fries With That? And is an allusion to the old joke about why anybody would need a degree in the humanities just to flip burgers. But it's also intended to highlight the disparate impact of our failure to connect the humanities with people's lives. The fact is that humanities will remain secure in wealthy institutions, private institutions like mine, which were built upon the foundation of liberal learning and its inextricable link to democratic engagement and civic responsibility. In contrast, the humanities will be under increasing scrutiny at public institutions, community colleges where I began my education, and other state colleges and universities. The real danger is that the humanities will be reduced solely to humanistic scholarship as pursued at elite institutions, disappearing in the process from those vectors, those humanistic practices that have the potential to provide the broadest access. In attempting to redress the risk that the scholarship will become reduced to itself, we should pay close attention to the communication mechanisms that might be employed in constructing the bridge between humanities scholarship and humanistic questions. The scholarship itself does not need to be accessible to the general public, but the humanistic practices that draw upon the scholarship to fuel their own momentum certainly do. Otherwise, the practices will fall away. Currently, those who are shaping public discourse and framing debates turn out more often than not, to be radio and television talk show hosts, political pundits, and zealots of one sort or another. These debates are also taking place on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and through other forms of social media. Hence, if the humanities rely exclusively on the mechanics of arcane study to get out their message, thus failing to utilize the most lively vectors for helping people cope with humanistic questions, the humanities as anything more than an ossified depository of ancient curiosity will die. Individuals will still thirst for humanistic guidance in seeking answers to their questions and compass points for their endeavors. But the humanities as an institution will become nothing more than self-referential as the frames of humanistic practice disappear and the bridge burns away forever. Whether it is tradition or elitism that prevents us from seeing some of the most vibrant forms of endeavor, Humanists must pay attention to the new modes of exploring human humanity's questions if they wish to sustain and fortify the bridge. Those who seek to defend the value of the humanities must be a visible force in the lives of the broadest possible segments of society. In the process, we must overcome a disdain for the media and recognize the power of radio, television, music, cyberspace, and popular forms of literature and art. Not all humanities scholars need to serve as public intellectuals, yet those who do must cultivate rich forms of practice and collaborate with those who have technical expertise beyond the academy, including both consulting and exploiting media to get at enduring questions. There are many examples of humanists who are doing just that. Alain de Baton, who became Heathrow's philosopher in residence, roamed from one terminal to another using his philosophical background to address the everyday concerns of travelers. Jennifer Hoyer, a professor of German literature at the University of Arkansas, teaches her students about the works of Rainer Maria Rilke by appealing to their knowledge of Lady Gaga. 
Inspired by Rilke's notion that we create who we are and we are who we create, Lady Gaga's depiction of fame recognizes the role of the audience in creating her identity. Hoyer points out that Lady Gaga's attempts to immortalize the listener can be understood by reading Rilke's sonnets to Orpheus. My own introduction to the connection between Lady Gaga and Rilke came when Professor Hoyer was a guest on a daily NPR program I host called the Academic Minute, which attempts to introduce listeners to cutting-edge research and scholarship taking place in colleges and universities across the country in, if not an actual minute, 90 seconds. Here, too, the goal is to provide frameworks for exploring humanistic questions and more. Naturally, we're talking NPR here. We will achieve an even sounder victory when we get some airplay on IMIS, but we take one step at a time. Americans can take cues from other cultures in this respect. The English culture critic Melvin Bragg takes up this challenge on a much broader and more significant scale. Bragg's BBC Radio 4 program, In Our Time, not only prevents listeners with content in areas of culture, philosophy, history, religion, and science, but also engages the audience through blogs and podcasts. A similar concept could be deployed here, even on the low floors of American culture. Imagine using the 21st century cultural phenomenon of Jer Jersey Shore, for instance, to draw out the themes in Boccaccio's The Decameron, or Brig Big Brother to explicate Sartre's most famous point in No Exit, that hell is other people. <clears throat> this is not a means of legitimizing shows like The Jersey Shore or Big Brother, but rather a plea for leveraging the objects of popular culture as a mechanism for promoting humanistic understanding, whether in the airport, classroom, radio, or television studio. Humanities practice can attempt to tap into the humanistic endeavors people engage in, thereby constructing a bridge to humanities scholarship. If we relinquish the opportunities that would extend our research reach and leave these channels of communication to the media moguls, public discourse will continue to decline. There will still be humanistic endeavors, barroom conversations, friendly debates, postmortems on movies, but they won't be illuminated by the frameworks of humanities practitioners. And if this comes to pass, if humanities questions and endeavors have no bridge whatsoever to the rich traditions of humanistic scholarship, then humanities lose, purely for the sake of didacti didactism, the chance to engender a true sense of wonder. A good practitioner is constantly building bridges. And those of, us in, those of us in the humanities not only have to make room for the construction of structures that traverse scholarship and inquiry, we also have to support the cultivation, valuing, and nurturing of these building projects. In the classroom, professors can make the humanities come alive for their students by drawing upon their own scholarship, but filtering it through the touch points of student experience to create frameworks for their students' humanistic questions and endeavors. Outside of the academy, Humanities scholars can apply their training and scholarship through service as public intellectuals. This may come in the form of volunteering on state councils for the humanities, giving public talks at local art museums, collaborating with scientists and policymakers in local environmental initiatives, offering dance and music workshops at a community center, contributing to the radio and television documentaries in the region, writing book reviews for popular press, or facilitating public forums on pressing issues of the day. In the past, these more fluid forms of humani humanistic engagement were recognized and celebrated as an extension of, or even a form of humanities scholarship. Many humanists skewed publishing in peer-reviewed scholarly journals and wrote instead for literary magazines. They recognized the need to speak beyond their own language game and perhaps even understood that the reification of narrow technical engagement with humanities scholarship threatens to kill the humanities. Unfortunately, we are at a point in our history when the professional structure of humanities scholarship is alienated from a more, more widespread humanistic comportment to life and thus from the very purpose of the humanities. Within institutions that encompass humanistic endeavors, practices, and scholarship, more than ever, there is a one-size-fits-all model a cubicle life in which there is a tendency to neglect the most vibrant vectors of the humanities, including teaching excellence, outreach, civic engagement, and literary and art criticism, 
all for the sake of acceptance among professional peers. Even humanities councils are trending away from public programming and toward supporting individual scholars. These institutional structures and practices reinforce humanities scholarship as divorced from the transformative framing capacity of humanities practice. I'm convinced that conformity to this model actually degrades the humanistic legacy. How then has this trend evolved? In part, it's a result of the scientism within the humanities with its attendant publish or perish ideology. When legitimacy comes through quantifiable research, regardless of how obscure the journals in which it is published, we neglect the living form of the humanities that manifests itself in a multitude of practices, from classroom teaching to service as public intellectuals. Adhering to a stark scientism has made us complicit in our own demise. Thus, in order for the humanities to flourish both within and beyond the walls of the academy, we need to embrace institutional structures that are themselves humanistic. Humanities activities should be measured in humanistic terms, not by eliminating scholarship, but by broadening what we value as an expression of that mastery. At the heart of what we value, first and foremost, should be teaching and service as humanists. As a college president, I'm mindful of the ways in which I can influence the prevailing structures in order to prevent the bridge of humanities practice from collapsing. Within the academy, te teaching excellence and public intellectualism must be held in equal esteem with scholarship published in peer-reviewed journal articles and supported by grant funding. The value of these activities should then be recognized through the tenure and promotion process. Yet we need to go beyond these established forms and reaffirm our commitment to developing the humanistic tradition in new and innovative ways, ways that bridge scholarship with enduring questions and collective endeavors. For instance, when I was a professor at the University of Rhode Island, I had a colleague who used her expertise in aesthetics and environmental philosophy to consult on the creation of water fire, a public sculpture, sculpture that includes the burning of a hundred bonfires on the surface of three rivers converging in Providence. She also partnered with a theater professor to use humanistic approaches to communication, which were tailored to scientists who wish to speak about or advocate for changes in public policy surrounding coastal resources. Another colleague spearheaded the use of public libraries in each town in the state to foster community conversations around race, ethnicity, and class, using such works as Toy Derricotte's The Black Notebooks, Anthony Appiah's Cosmopolitanism, Jonathan Kozal's Amazing Grace, as a means of bringing together diverse groups of community members for discussion within the libraries. The authors and community members were then invited to the university where students were simultaneously reading the books as a way of expanding the conversational circles and promoting access to institutions of higher education for ordinary citizens. Still another colleague at a different institution used the digital humanities to chronicle explorations of the North Pole. His daily blogs were wildly popular and introduced readers to a panoply of information about the history of global expeditions. They also provided readers with a glimpse into how historians of the future might create archives in the absence of traditional forms of scholarly communication. At many colleges and universities across the country, art and art historians are being used to teach medical students observational techniques that, rely, that they'll rely on as practitioners. Philosophers are applying what they know from studying philosophy for children and using it to shape primary and secondary school curricula. Moreover, Humanistic residencies are popping up within underserved populations in retirement communities, hospices, ghettos, psychiatric wards, and prisons. Though these practices are not yet mainstreamed within the academy or within society at large, they remind us that publication is not the only and perhaps not even the best currency of academic excellence. Humanities excellence includes practice as well as scholarship, and yet at present, the examples I have cited go largely unrecognized as legitimate forms of humanities practice within academic institutions. They are happily allowed as a sidebar so long as journal submissions stay up. We go so far as to discourage pre-tenured faculty from engaging in too much service, even on and within their own campuses. And we unremittingly insist that scholarship be valued over teaching in the tenure and promotion process. Activities engaging actual 
questioning human beings, whether in the classroom or in the community, drops out of professional focus. And yet, what is the humanities if not transformative for human beings? It is time for those of us within the humanities to call upon academic professionals, public agencies, and philanthropic organizations to be innovators in our own lives. We should encourage private foundations to invest more actively in program officers who can cult uh, cultivate non-traditional vectors and embrace humanistic practice as another category of what we do. Academic institutions should actively reconsider pathways to recruitment, retention, and promotion of professors, not by marginalizing scholarship, but by placing it into reasonable balance with humanistic modes of activity in the classroom and beyond. Through humanities practice, we can articulate the value of humanities education in a more compelling way and resolve the seemingly insurmountable paradox arising from the widening fissure between the institutional prestige of humanities scholarship and the enduring questions and endeavors that remain most fundamental when we deal with questions of human existence. In doing so, we position the humanities as the necessity that it is and not a mere luxury. But this cannot happen without an honest and perhaps radical reckoning with the extent to which we in the academy have let scientism slip into our own self-assessment, allowing the counting of beans to eclipse humanistic modes of practice as a proper extension of what it is that we do. There is something deeply wrong in letting an emphasis on publication occlude the quality of engagement with humanistic questions and endeavors in the classroom and beyond. Humanities practice is the bridge we need to build, not, nearly, not merely to recover a lively but neglected manifestation of training in humanities scholarship, but also perhaps to save our regions of thought and practice from slipping into canyon desiccation, into accusations of irrelevance and illegitimacy and collusion in the growth of intellectual oligarchy, where only the very richest and most prestigious institutions preserve access to humanistic traditions. We should not collude. We must say no to scientism and resurrect humanistic models of value and assessment in the judgment of our work. Only then can the humanities practice bridge the paradoxical gap of scholarly immersion and enduring questions and endeavors. Only then will the humanities be functionally humane. Thank you. <laughs>